As I think about the time described in 1 Samuel and early in the history of Israel, it's bad. It is really bad. I, I, when I start describing it, the, the way that it starts to come together in my mind is uh, what I think of as what I call the Star Wars scroll. You know, in the beginning of any of the Star Wars movies, the real Star Wars movies and those three new ones, uh, there are uh, these big block letters in space, big yellow block letters, and they're scrolling up and they describe the situation to get you, you caught up with what is happening. And so I'd like you to imagine with me what I'm about to say as the block letters in space setting the scene for what is about to happen. It is a period of war and rebellion. Israel is deeply troubled. They have come to the promised land, yet now are beset on all sides by new problems and challenges. The Philistines press in on them, it seems like, from every side. Israel is militarily weak, economically disadvantaged, politically scattered and confused as the twelve tribes bicker. There is a desperate need for change because it's, as it stands, there is no future, there is no hope. Who will lead the people? The story of the Hebrew people, right, before we get to the point of the block letters in space, but the story of the Hebrew people, uh, it begins in the depths of slavery and then f goes on with them until they go, to, uh, through the, go through the exodus. They go to Mount Sinai. They receive the law. They spend 40 years in the wilderness being trained on how to be God's people. And then they enter the promised land. And this is supposed to be their moment. They have entered the promised land. But instead of being the, the fulfillment of this promise, it's not peace. It's more like the Wild West. This is uh, what we have recorded in the book of Judges. And that time is just sheer craziness. The sheer uh, weirdness of what happens in, in, in the book of Judges. I mean, we have invading generals fleeing, being uh, drawn into tents by women, and then ha falling asleep to have their uh, heads pegged to the, pounded to the floor with a tent peg. I mean, it's just sort of crazy things are happening here. And, and so, in this time of the book of Judges, Israel has become a place of moral chaos, full of uh, brutality and betrayed by undisciplined religion. And, and the, the sum, summation of what's happening there, it, it, happens, it happens five times in, in the book of uh, Judges, in the last chapters. We, what we hear is, in those days, Israel had no king, and everyone did as he saw fit. What a horrible refrain. Everyone did as he saw fit. What happens when everyone does as they see fit? Well, it gets bad. It gets real bad. And that's how we end the book of Judges. And then we flip the page and we go into 1 Samuel. And there is a desperate situation we read of here. But we go from the big national desperation of a nation ripping itself apart because everyone is doing as they see fits. There is no king in Israel. And it's just crazy. We go from this sort of national desperation to an intense desperation on a personal scale. As we go from Judges to 1 Samuel, we move from Israel, all of Israel, down to Hannah. And Hannah, a single woman, is married to Elkanah. Elkanah is a good husband. He's a good man, a good family. They are pillars of the community. They'd be the type of people you want them to be as your neighbors, if you don't already have great neighbors already. I mean, they're the folks, they're going up to the, the temple every year to offer sacrifices of thanksgiving. They inspire other people to, be, to follow in their footsteps. They're just great folks, right? And, and every year they go to worship and they sacrifice an animal to God and then they have this feast of thanksgiving, much like we have at our, our thanksgiving meals. And at this, this, this feast of thanksgiving, Alcana, this great husband, gives Hannah the double portion. The double portion is usually an honor only given to the, 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 the son who will inherit, the eldest son. So for the wife to be given the double portion, that is, that is an amazing honor. But Hannah, she is sitting there at the table with her family and um, husband, her husband's other wife and, and the other wife's children, and she cannot give thanks. 
for she has no children. She cannot uh, give thanks, for she has not been able to have children, and she has not obeyed the very first commandment that comes up in the Bible. Very first thing that God says, that is a commandment, that's a, a directive. The very first thing God says is in Genesis 1.28 is, Be fruitful and multiply. It's the first commandment, be fruitful and multiply. And she has not been fruitful and multiplied, and she doesn't understand why, and that only makes the frustration worse. And so just as there seems to be no future for Israel, there also seems to be no future for her. And it doesn't help that the second wife, Panina is her name, is rubbing it into Hannah's face, right? And so we have this situation, both Israel and Hannah are just bitter and hopeless. That's the situation we find. This goes on for years. And then Hannah does something. She does something. Hannah goes to worship on, when the, she, they go to their uh, yearly pilgrimage to, to make their Thanksgiving sacrifice. And uh, she prays in worship of God. She prays and she takes it seriously. Right? She takes it seriously. She asks for a son and expecting it to happen. But this time she does something different. She offers the child to God, offering to give to God any son that she has. Right? And maybe in doing so she is on to something. Maybe she finally sees how everything is God's. Everything. Everything is God's. Right? And now that she recognizes this, now that she is able to turn to God and recognize that any child that she has is not her child, it's God's child with whom she has been entrusted, but it is God's child first. Now that she understands this, maybe that is why God opens her womb. Maybe it's that she is desperate. She, and with the desperation of a woman desiring a child, she is finally willing to let go of the future that she desires and let God be in control. We don't know exactly what she's thinking. We don't know what she, how this is going on in her heart. But we, what we do know is that she came to worship and she prayed and something happened. The priest there, Eli, tells her, Go in peace and may the God of Israel grant the petition you have made. And Hannah goes out, and now she can join the feast, for she can be thankful, for she will have a child. And she does. She knows there is a way, the way forward, and so she can enjoy the double portion that her husband offers her. And so she does have a child, and in due time, she offers this child to the service of the Lord at the place where they've gathered for worship for years. And this child will be trained by uh, the, the priest, Eli, and he will be the one to anoint King Saul and then King David, the kings of Israel who bring a stop to the Wild West and then start to bring stability and peace to the nation, right? Samuel sets the stage for Saul and then for David, these three great men of God who will each move Israel forward such that, excuse me, the Philistines will no longer be a threat and will, will no longer be a threat and there will be a religious unity as the 12 tribes unite under David. There is hope, there is a future for both Israel and for Hannah because Hannah prayed and took it seriously and offered this child to God. And so she gives thanksgiving in a song that we read. Uh, this is the song of Hannah, and this is the translation from the message. What she says, she sings is, I'm bursting with God news, I'm walking on air, laughing at my rivals and dancing my salvation. Just, just an aside there. What would it look like to dance your salvation? We tend to be kind of rather staid and, and calm. What would it look like to dance? Because you are so excited for salvation. She continues, Nothing and no one is holy like God, no rock mountain like our God. Don't dare talk pretentiously, not a word of boasting ever. For God knows what's going on. He takes the measure of everything that happens. The weapons of the strong are smashed to pieces, while the weak are infused with fresh strength. The well-fed are out begging in the streets for crusts, while the hungry are getting second helpings. The barren woman has a house full of children, while the mother of many is bereft. God brings death and God brings life, brings down to the grave and raises up. God brings poverty and God brings wealth. He lowers, he also lifts up. He puts poor people on their feet again. He rekindles burned out lives with fresh hope, restoring dignity and respect to their lives, a place in the sun. For the very structures of earth are God's. He has laid out his operations on a firm foundation. He protectively cares for his faithful friends step by step, but leaves the wicked to stumble in the dark. No one makes it in this life by sheer muscle. 
God's enemies will be blasted out of the sky, crashed in a heap and burned. God will set things right all over the earth. He'll give strength to his king. He'll set his anointed on top of the world. You hear the theme there? The last shall be first and the first shall be last. That it's going to work out. That God is, control, is in control. That there is a future. In the near future, Hannah has a future because God has acted and she, uh, and she has kids. Israel has a future because Samuel will be the instrument by which the, the next kings of Israel, or the, the first kings of Israel, are, are chosen. And it also, this also hints at our future, right? For the, this, this theme of reversal, the last first and the first last, that is what shows up in, in Mary's song in Luke 1.46 when she uh, is singing of the birth of Jesus. And this, it's a time that is very similar. Uh, Israel's in turmoil. It's not the Philistines, but the Romans who are causing problems. And, and the birth of the child opens up a new future. I mean, there, there's a lot of analogies here, but... Uh, a lot of those will have to wait till Christmas. Because right now, we're looking at Thanksgiving, right? And so Thanksgiving, this th Thanksgiving is this season in which we give thanks for our blessings. That, that's the terminology we, we tend to use. We give thanks for our blessings. And we toss around the, those words, and specifically one of those words, we toss it around a lot. But I'm not sure we always fully understand what it means. We toss around the word blessing. I want to take a minute to, to, to take a look at what that means for something to be a blessing, to bless something. In Hannah, we see an amazing example of blessing. She has this long-desired child and she blesses it. She devotes it to God and God's purpose, purposes. You know, what she is doing, the idea of blessing something, I never really understood what it meant to bless until I read, uh, these, these are the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I came across this scrap of poetry, this bit of prayer which he jotted down, saying that uh, blessing means to lay our hands on something and say, despite everything, you belong to God. Right. To bless something. It, 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 that's what Dietrich call, uh, it says is our calling in this world. To lay our hands on the world and to say, you are meant for God's purposes. And I am calling you to God's purposes. I'm calling you to be part and to play your part in God's plan. And I think that's true. I think that's what it means to bless. To bless is to claim something as good and uh, as God's and as having a purpose for God. To put, that puts some real meat on the word bless, doesn't it? It kind of fleshes that out. When we call something a blessing, when we say, it is such a blessing for you to show up with food when I'm laid up and sick, what we're saying is, that food is doing exactly what God means for it to do. To be a blessing is to do what God's intention is. So we call something a blessing. What we're saying is that this is in line with what God desires. This is in line with what God plans. And so when Hannah blesses her child, what she is doing and saying, this child is going to be raised to do what God desires. And because this child does as God desires, as part of God's plan, this child has a powerful impact on her life, and on the life of all of Israel. And her future opens in front of her, and the future of all of Israel opens in front of Israel because of a child that is blessed. Because of a child that is in line with God's plan, God's desires. <clears throat> her son Samuel is the last judge and the first prophet who appoints Saul who then is followed by David. David brings Israel together, makes Jerusalem its capital, writes the book that we now call the Psalms, and is the beginning of the dynasty of the kings of Israel in which Jesus follows. All of this is made possible because Hannah blesses a child, claims it for God. This season, if you, like Hannah, find yourself yearning for something, what might that be? 
What do you desire most? Like Hannah, what do you just deeply desire? What is your, your heart's just, the thing you just desire so deeply? Often in worship, we'll share joys and concerns, and we'll, we'll ask for things, we'll pray for aunt so-and-so, we'll talk about a concern. But what's the desire that you have that is too deep to name in the middle uh, of worship because it is just too hard upon you, and if you started to say it, you might break down? Would you risk blessing that desire? Would you risk blessing what it is and say, if this is to be, I will offer it to God and God's purposes? Or, if you already have what you most desire, if you already have the thing that you give most thanks for this season, whether it is something you can touch or far more likely something you cannot touch, peace at the table and a family to gather, right? Would you bless it? Would you dare pray to God that this thing that I treasure most, I am blessing it. I am offering to line it up with your plan, with your will, with your desire. Right. My friends, I believe that whatever God gives, God gives with a purpose. And that when we receive what God gives, when we accept, what we, when we accept that what we receive has a purpose, that then it, is, it becomes blessed. It becomes aligned with what God desires. And so, my friends, there's nothing greater I could pray for you on this day of thanksgiving than that you and your life be blessed. May your life, may all that you have, be lined up with God's desires, with God's dreams, with God's plans. Amen.